Good morning. Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. My name is Jeremy Nettles. I am the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ in Newburgh, Indiana. If you'd like to reach out and get in contact with us, then you feel free to give us a text or a call at 812-550-6234 or send email to info at riverridgechurch.org. Today, we're looking at Paul's letter to the Roman Christians. As we go through Romans, we're going to be focusing on the broad reasons that Paul wrote this letter and also the broad truths that it teaches us. It could be argued that Romans is the most important book of the Bible. Now, you might think that it seems crazy to call anything other than one of the Gospels the most important book of the Bible. But the fact is that Romans talks an awful lot about the Gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't tell the story of his life on earth so much, but it tells what he was doing in more spiritual terms. Paul, when he's writing this letter, has not actually met most of these Christians at Rome, and his aims, as a result, are pretty broad because he just doesn't know them. What he does, for the most part, throughout this letter is to lay out the gospel in a very systematic fashion. As far as we know, the only people that Paul actually knows at Rome, the only Christians that he knows, are the ones mentioned in chapter 16, verse 3. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. This is not the first time we've met these two. Do you remember? Back in Acts chapter 18. Let's read the first three verses. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. There's a surprising amount to learn from these two sentences. First of all, we get an idea of the timing. This is on the second missionary journey around the year 51. We also learn the location. Of course, this is in Corinth, where Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla the first time. Their origin and nationality is brought up. They are Jewish. But further, they've also recently come from Italy. And their reason for leaving Italy was that the emperor Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So that specifies what part of Italy they were leaving. And as it happens, when Claudius died, his stepson Nero took over as emperor. And we mostly think of Nero as being a complete loon. And, and that's accurate. He was an awful emperor at the end of his reign. But we, we can divide up his reign into good Nero and bad Nero. And the first portion of his reign, while his mother was still around and a lot of his uh, other sort of mentors and good influences were around, was actually fairly reasonable. And one of his actions was to rescind his stepfather's order against the Jews and to allow the Jews to return to Rome if they wished to do so. And so a few years later, as we read in Romans 16, Aquila and Priscilla had done so. Surely they're not the only ones. Many Jews returned to Rome and many Jewish Christians returned to Rome. So what we're painting here is a picture of a relatively young church in Rome that for the past several years under Claudius's decree did not include many or perhaps any Jewish Christians. And now they've gotten an influx of Jewish Christians. And this is a society that harbors a, a very strong anti-Jewish sentiment. Paul is therefore going to make a plea to Christians of, of this rather anti-Jewish culture to be accepting of Jewish Christians. So, let's consider the text. In chapter 1, let's read the, the, the introduction, the first eight or so verses. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God and power, according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, 
I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, etc. In this somewhat verbose introduction, Paul has given a good idea of his purpose in writing and a preview to what he is going to say. And this continues through the next several verses, especially I'd like to highlight verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We're already starting to see some of the dynamics between Jews and Gentiles, especially as they pertain to the gospel of Jesus Christ and salvation. Paul starts his explanation of this gospel with some pretty bad news. Human beings are universally sinful. And that continues through the rest of chapter 1 and chapter 2 and really all the way through the end of chapter 3. But within this, he has to demonstrate the sinfulness of these two main groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. So let's begin in chapter 2, verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? He continues on with some other sinful behaviors. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 5. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? You can see how there's some tension between these two propositions. The idea is that humanity is sinful and humanity's sinfulness serves to highlight and glorify, in some sense, God and his perfection. But if my evil actions serve to glorify God, then how can they be considered to be entirely evil? And further, maybe God sort of forced me into doing this. But that's just not the case. Well, fresh off of that, Paul then talks about the relationship between sin and law. And the law, in some sense, amplifies sense. But... Verse 21, Now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We are unworthy. Whatever righteous deeds we do are not enough to counteract the unrighteous deeds we have done. We all fall short of the glory of God. God's righteousness is demonstrated in his grace in redeeming us. What does that redemption look like? What does it mean? It's not just some hocus-pocus, goofy notion of some sort of uh, transcendent moral goodness. That, that's not really what God's talking about. He's talking about two things. One is very spiritual, and one is spiritual but has a, a more obvious physical manifestation. He's talking about redemption as in eternal salvation and the privilege of abiding in God's presence forever when this life is over, and also the redeemed life, the transformed life on earth, the life of righteousness, the life that allows Christ to live through us. So what does this transformed life look like, and how does it occur? Moving on to chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. 
And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So Paul has made it very clear that this righteousness that was imputed to Abraham was not based on works of the law. First of all, it couldn't be based on the works of the law of Moses because the law of Moses hadn't come yet. But on top of that, it wasn't even based on his adherence to the innate counterpart of the law of Moses, which was discussed back in chapter 2, when Gentiles do by nature what the law requires. And that seems crazy to say that Abraham was considered righteous before God, not on the basis of his works, but on the basis of his faith. How do you prove this, Paul? Let's keep reading. Chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Is this blessing, then, only for the circumcised, or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How, then, was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. This whole time he's been appealing back to this passage in Genesis 15 verse 6 that says that Abraham believed God and God counted it to Abraham as righteousness. But that came even before Abraham was circumcised. So it wasn't on the basis of his works. It was, as the verse says, on the basis of his belief in what God said. And those who walk in the same footsteps of the faith that Abraham had, Paul says that Abraham is our father as well. He moves on from here to discuss the relationship of faith and justification and grace and the hope of glory. I'd like to read a couple of verses from chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So all these things are kind of swimming around in the spiritual ether, and where are the works? It's easy to take this, this line of reasoning that Paul is, is pulling us down and take it right off the deep end. And this has often been done to say that our conduct in the world doesn't matter. But it does as we will see. Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So what then? I, I thought Paul said works weren't involved. The grace, the faith, all of that. And now, Paul, you're, you're turning it around on us and saying that we were not allowed to sin? Let's keep reading. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Jump down to verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. So now it's all about works? I thought we were helpless in that regard. So how? Let's back up a little. Back to chapter 5, let's read verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Christ Jesus. Okay, that whole sentence is kind of loaded, but the free gift of righteousness, what does that mean? 
It's equally ambiguous in Greek as it is in English, but there are basically two options. This is what we would call a subjective or an objective genitive. It's either a subjective genitive, in which case the righteousness is delivering the gift, and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, or it could be an objective genitive, in which case righteousness is the gift. That also doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. But let's read verse 19. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Made righteous. Righteousness is the gift. They have been made to conform to the image of his Son. This sounds really weird. It's the sort of metaphysical, mind-bending, tough-to-understand proposition that might be impossible to implement. Paul will discuss that presently, chapter 7. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. This is something deeper than the physical world around us. That the standard we're supposed to be upholding and the, the method, the, the manner of our service to God is not simply adherence to a list of 613 commandments in the law of Moses. It's deeper. For the rest of the chapter, he discusses the continuing struggle against sin, using himself as an example. It's not some impersonal, irresistible urge, but, but choices that we have to make in our everyday lives. And the redeemed are going to start making those choices on the basis of what Christ has said. They're going to start making Christ's choices. Okay, how do we do that? Are we going to be compelled against our will or beyond our will to become righteous? Let's read what he says in chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit." For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We still need to please God, and it's still going to be a struggle. But we're no longer doomed. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are no longer to be walking according to the flesh. We're no longer to be considering the reality of the world around us to be limited to the physical that we can see with our own eyes. We're supposed to start seeing through the spiritual lens. We're supposed to start seeing through what God's Spirit tells us right here in His Word and to understand the spiritual battles that are going on around us and among us and within us. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, through his Spirit who dwells in you. Just as we believe that this life in the flesh is not all there is to life and that there is something beyond it, just as we believe that God will give us new life, raising us from death just as he raised his Son, we're supposed to be living in the present in the Spirit through God's life-giving Spirit. Verse 12, so then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. This is the choice that we all have to make. Are we going to be sons of the flesh or sons of God?
At this point in the letter, Paul transitions over to talking about the gap between the Jews and the Gentiles. That starts in 9 through 11, I guess you could say, describing how the Jews were formerly blessed. They were entrusted with a lot. They were the first converts to Christianity. They were the ones who drove the spread of Christianity at the beginning. But they were also predominantly opposing and persecuting the church. And yet, with all of that going on, God chose to spread all of those promises to the Gentiles as well. And of course, that had been the plan all along. But, as, as it seems, the Jews have by and large rejected the gospel, and the Gentiles have now taken to it much more kindly. Paul is very dissatisfied with that arrangement, as he says in chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Okay, why is Paul doing this? Why is he going down this line of argument and distracting from, you know, the gospel, which formed the first eight chapters of the letter? Well, it's all really still part of the same discussion. The reason that he went through all of that stuff in the gospel was that he is concerned about the Jewish Christians who have now returned to Rome and are likely to be despised by the predominantly Gentile Christians already there. This is a culture that already has a significant racial and religious prejudice against the Jews. And to top that off, these Jewish Christians by and large are going to adhere to a lot of traditions and scruples that aren't actually bound on all Christians. And Gentile converts, now having to deal with that, might feel the judgmental gaze of some of these Jewish Christians as well. So this goes back to the conflict between flesh and spirit. Paul wants to tell these Christians to deal with their conflicts according to the spirit rather than the flesh. That's how he begins chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is about cultivating in ourselves a spiritual mindset that's not just the rote memorization and adherence to something like the Law of Moses. Paul leaves a lot of these instructions broad for a reason. It's not always totally clear how we ought to act, because God is, frankly, more interested in our hearts, at least as a starting point. We can go back to chapter 10 and read verses uh, 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, of course, there's more to that story as usual, but it's, there's no denying that it starts in the heart. And that's what he's really getting at when we come to chapters 14 and 15, dealing with differences starting in the heart. This is primarily about Jew-Gentile differences of conscience within the church, but it doesn't exclusively have to be about such matters. It applies to us, too. So, in this letter, Paul focused a lot on the gospel for the first eight chapters. That's really all it was about. Universal sin and God's immense grace and righteousness, salvation by grace through faith, that, that faith bringing about righteousness rather than our, our former sinful man. We talked about how righteousness means being transformed and living a spiritual life that is manifested in good works. And oh, by the way, good works include treating your brothers and sisters well even when you disagree. The upshot of this appears in chapter 14, beginning in verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Every single one of us has to give his own account to God, and you don't get a vote as to whether I'm saved or not, and I don't get a vote as to whether you're saved or not. We're not supposed to be presenting ourselves as each other's judges. Now, God has made most things very clear. 
And if I read you God's word that condemns one of your behaviors, that's not me passing judgment on you. That's God passing judgment. However, when God has not made the judgment absolutely clear, and I presume to tell you, you shouldn't do that or you should do this, now I'm on much shakier ground. I don't get a vote and you don't get a vote. It's all down to God. He is the judge. We ought to be more concerned with not getting in each other's way and then worrying about our own relationship with God, pursuing that relationship in faith and devotion. Chapters 15 and 16 cover more personal stuff, uh, it's including an example of Paul going to great lengths to do exactly the same principles that he was espousing in chapters 14 and the beginning of 15. Going the extra mile. That's a great example. It's not a work of the law. It's a work of the Spirit. It's the kind of righteousness practiced by those who, to borrow from chapter 6, verse 17, are obedient from the heart. And it's a lofty goal. But I assure you it is worth the effort. It's what God has called us to do. Like Paul and, and like Christ, each of us ought to strive to be a force for good and for righteousness and for mercy. Be willing to take more than your fair share of the load. You're not capable of doing that on your own, but God's strength can enable you to do so. And this also leads to receiving more than your fair share of blessing. And maybe that occurs in this life, but certainly we can look forward to eternal salvation that none of us actually deserves. We're not talking about a quid pro quo. We're not talking about earning wages from God. What we're talking about is enacting the reasonable and compulsory response to the offer God has made. Be like Christ in death and resurrection. This is a spiritual death and resurrection shown and embodied in a transformed life. It's also a symbolic death and resurrection. We can see that in the act of baptism. It's also a literal death and resurrection. Every one of us is going to die as far as this fleshly body is concerned, but we can look forward to being raised as God raised his son. So set about with the life that you have, serving God with all of the talents he has given you. Let's close as Paul closes the letter. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. If you need our help, we would love to provide it at River Ridge. You can call or text us at 812-550-6234 or send email to info at riverridgechurch.org. You can find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh. We gather at 9 a.m. on Sundays for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship, 4 p.m. for afternoon worship, and 7 p.m. on Wednesdays for another study. I'd love to see you there. Thanks for joining me today on Iron Sharpens Iron.